Hello, everyone. This is Craig Nikitas. On April 28th, uh, I began to present a webinar on the Cooper's Hawk. Unfortunately, we ran into computer issues, which led to shutting things down early and leaving out some vital aspects of the presentation I wanted to give you. Uh, in that first presentation, we discussed generalities about raptor characteristics, ID methodology, vision in raptors, and taxonomy. Today, I'm recording the part of the program I was unable to present by starting right in with a focus on excipiters and especially the tidal bird. There will be a little bit of repetition from what you saw last Tuesday, but the main focus will be on Cooper's hawks, how to identify them, related species, and their life cycle. So let's begin. As an important part of Raptor ID, flight patterns are vital to recognize. I'm showing you video here made available by Jerry Liguri of a Cooper's Hawk in soaring flight with fairly flat wings. But you'll notice the proportions of the body and the way the wings are held at the horizontal or slightly below. And here's a companion video that shows the characteristic flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide pattern of flight of a Cooper's Hawk that is climbing or trying to rise on thermals or updrafts. So we talked a little bit about the various forms and shapes of genera and families of raptors and talked about the occipiter build being relatively short-winged with very long tails. And what that has evolved to enable them to do is to fly quickly, amazingly fast, and very adeptly through tight spaces in the forests where they dwell. Uh, here's a video of a goshawk in flight going through some very tight spaces in slow motion. Notice how the short wings and the long tail are maneuvered to let them pass through tight spaces vertically, horizontally, tucking the wings in and so forth. And now the next slide shows you an interesting chart of the three North American excipiter species in various ages and in various conformations. Um, the column on the right shows our smallest, the sharp-shinned hawk. The top one is a topside view of a juvenile bird. Next down is a wing-on view of an adult bird, followed by a, another juvenile bird seen from underneath, a juvenile bird perched, and then finally an adult bird perched. And you can compare that to the next larger Cooper's Hawk in the same conformations and ages of juvenile adult, juvenile, juvenile adult. And then finally, our largest one, the Northern Goshawk, which is seldom seen in the Bay Area, but occasionally wayward juvenile birds do pass through the Bay Area on their way to find their own territories. So this is the smallest of the small. This is a male adult sharp-shinned hawk in hand. That's about a 100-gram bird, and 
In adult plumage, you can see the orangish breast, the darker cap, and the eye slowly beginning to turn red as the bird ages. And that's followed by a dorsal view showing the grayish back as opposed to the juvenile plumage where the back is brownish and the tail is banded with light brown and dark grayish brown tail bands. Notice the yellow eye of a juvenile bird. Um, the sharp shinned hawk is just as adept as the uh, goshawk we saw flying in tight spaces, quickly maneuvering like a little fighter jet to go after its desired prey, which consists largely of birds. These are a couple of Stellar's jays who are about the same size as the sharp shin that will come in and chase them around. But you can see how quickly that sharp shin was able to follow the escape maneuvers of the, the Stellar's jays. Um, here's a northern goshawk in flight from underneath too, and you can compare that plumage to the adult bird, which is very different from the other adult exhibitors in North America. Very intricate, horizontal, dark barring on the breast and underparts, and the underwing coverts are also intricately barred. Um, the uh, top view is of a steel gray back. This is a juvenile goshawk uh, we banded in the Marin Headlands oh so many years ago. Um, about every five or six years of the 1,200 to 1,500 birds we band annually, a northern goshawk will show up. And there's a close-up view of its head. And then for comparison, here's an underside shot of a juvenile Cooper's hawk in flight. Note the brownish appearance of the dark pigmentation, very clean, neat vertical barring on the breast and underparts that stops right about the legs and under tail coverts. Um, the tail banding of an occipiter is apparent. And also look at the graduated lengths of tail feathers there with the central feathers being very much longer than the outer feathers of the tail when it's folded up like that. And let's darken this just so we can focus on the silhouette and the proportions. Here are the short occipiter wings and the very long tail in comparison to the overall body length. That was a juvenile Cooper's Hawk in hand and uh, get, gives you a sense of its call and its head proportions. Very large head on the body compared to sharp shinned hawks, which we'll talk more about in detail soon. And then there was a banded bird heading off to resume its wildlife. So our forest hawk, the Cooper's Hawk, is becoming increasingly common and we'll talk a little bit more about its population growth in a minute. But let's start looking at the natural history and life cycle. The um, Cooper's Hawks were first classified in the early 1800s by Euro-American explorers. Um, they were uh, named by a French naturalist named Charles Bonaparte and he named the bird after William Cooper, a fellow naturalist who collected early specimens, which, like with John Audubon, meant going out with a firearm and shooting as many birds of each species they could to study their uh, plumage and body forms and then present the specimens to museums. The exhibitor name uh, of this genus is a Latin generic word for hawk. And exhibitors are a cosmopolitan genus. They're found on every continent except Antarctica. And species um, names in English in most countries contain the word hawk, such as sparrow hawk, goshawk, sharp shinned hawk, Cooper's hawk. The exhibitor species are known as forest hawks because they generally nest and breed and hunt among woodlands. They're also called bird hawks because birds comprise 80% of their diet. But as we'll see, Cooper's hawks are spreading into uh, human-occupied lands in rural, suburban, and especially urban areas, hence the subtitle of this, Life Beyond the Forest. 
Although their range is widespread and they're becoming more populous, they're often unobserved because of the stealthy nature of their uh, behavior and hunting methods. We talked about the three exhibitor species. Um, here's a close-up of a juvenile Cooper's hawk in hand. Uh, note the very flattened, almost axe-shaped head. Note the Roman nose beak where there's very little indentation between the serre where the beak meets the head and the curved shape of the forehead. Also notice that the eye is set forward of the center line of that profile. Uh, the bird has a very fierce look like a lot of raptors. It has a bony process over its eye of a formation which when feathered is called the supercilium. The juveniles of all three exhibitor species can show a prominent white plumage coloration on that supercilium. Um, and then in the adult goshawk, it's often very present as well. Their populations had markedly declined as uh, settlers spread across the United States, um, but the, they have rebounded over the past few decades. The global population is estimated to be over a million individuals. Um, the rebound in populations occurred largely because of several factors. One is that these birds are now legally protected under the Migratory Bird Act, and fewer of them are being shot even when they enter people's chicken coops in search of prey although occasionally that does result in a fatality for the hawk. Um, another reason is that uh, banning of DDT in North America greatly helped these birds and their reproductive success, just as with the more well-known instances of peregrine falcons, bald eagles, and ospreys. When DDT enters the environment and accumulates in the tissues of prey, and then accumulates in even greater concentrations in the tissues of their predators, the metabolic product of it, DDE, interferes with the formation of calcium in the egg-laying cycle, resulting in eggs that do not hatch. Um, so banning that enabled greater nest success among a lot of our bird species. There Populations have grown to the point now where they are li listed as a species of least concern, meaning that their populations are doing well and not under threat of decline or even extinction. However, that was not the case in earlier times. Uh, in Victorian eras, um, people made moral judgments about animals' behavior and life cycles and raptors were often vilified. Um, the piece of art on the right shows an eagle carrying off a young child, and then one of Thomas Edison's early special effects showed a taxidermied eagle doing the same thing with that poor crying child. Um, this very seldom happens in real life. However, despite that, um, hawks were judged to be either good birds or bad birds, the bad ones being raptors that took uh, prey that people considered domestic fowl or prey that was delightful songbirds which were good and pure and the evil raptors needed to be exterminated to protect poultry and those good songbirds. Um, this killing was an annual event on Hawk Mountain and eventually led to Hawk Mountain being declared a sanctuary where hunting was discouraged and eventually banned. Um, prior to that, there were annual shoots where folks would go up there with long guns and kill all the migrating raptors overhead in the thousands each year. This is the current range map for Cooper's Hawks with the tan area showing summer populations, the blue area in the southern latitudes showing where those birds winter, and the green band across the U.S. showing where the Cooper's Hawk can be found year-round. Interestingly, the northernmost populations migrate the farthest south 
and the middle green bands generally stay put, although, of course, at the boundaries, there's some of each instance occurring. Um, they have a huge global range because North America is so big, uh, about 3.2 million square miles. And uh, the habitats that they occupy in those ranges include the uh, extensive forests we've discussed, also smaller woodlots. Uh, they can easily pass between uh, fragmented habitats. They also love the edges of habitats where they can lurk in trees or bushes and pounce on birds that are in the open area beyond the edges of those habitats. In the West, they often near water, whether it's uh, running water, lakes, ponds, or even underground aquifers. Uh, they're commonly found near bodies of water. Uh, they're very common below 3,000 feet. They range easily up to 6,000 feet. And as far as I know, they haven't been found above a 9,000 foot elevation. As we mentioned, their ranges and habitats are spreading and opening up, and as a result, nesting densities in those areas have increased. In terms of the length of life, uh, you probably know most young raptors don't get through their first year of life. With various conditions and species, 50 to 70 percent of fledglings that uh, hatch never make it into uh, breeding age. Cooper's hawks survive in the wild once they get through that first year with an average of between 7 to 15 years. The longevity record for wild Cooper's hawks at this point is 20.4 years. This was a Cooper's hawk that was banded in the Marin headlands and then over 20 years later discovered dead in Washington state. Recently, a bird that was banded in the Pacific Northwest 20 years ago was also found in, I believe, Oregon. I'm not sure that that band has been verified yet, but that would also be another 20-year wild bird. In terms of size, their lengths are 14 to 18 inches with a wingspan of uh, 27 to a little under 3 feet, so roughly a crow size bird. Our western Cooper's hawks are much smaller than their eastern relatives, about 15% smaller by uh, length and weight. They also exhibit the common reverse size dimorphism, where, as in all North American raptors except the burrowing owl, the females are larger than the males, which is called reverse because we're biased as mammals, where typically males are larger. Um, the males can be about two-thirds the weight of the females, and on the West Coast, males weigh on average 278 grams or less than 10 ounces, and the females are over 400 grams or less than 15 ounces for those of us who are metrically challenged. The, there's also a plumage dimorphism based on age, whereas I mentioned earlier the juvenile plumage is basically brownish on the top side with a very pale whitish underside and very crisp brown vertical teardrop streaking. Um, a yellow eye in the hatchlings. When they first leave the nest, the breast may, instead of being white, have a buff or peach colored undertone that fades in the sun over the next few weeks of life. And you can Contrast that to the adult plumage. Notice the contrasting dark charcoal cap, the light nape at the back of the head, and then this bird would also have a gray back, slightly lighter in tone than the dark cap. The underparts and breast have horizontal barring in a rust color, and in um, Similar view here, you can contrast the adult and juvenile plumages. Also notice the eye color with the adult getting a red eye, the juvenile bird a yellow eye if you could see it. 
And then also notice the lengths of the tail feathers. Uh, people say, oh, Cooper's hawks have rounded tails and sharp shins have square tails. But when the tail feathers are folded, a Cooper's hawk tail can look more square, especially from the uh, dorsal side. And a sharp shinned hawk can also look rounded depending on how the feathers are folded and stacked. But from underneath like this, you can see the central long tail feathers which stack on top of the dorsal side of the tail are much longer than the outer tail feathers which gradually decrease in length to the two most outer ones that you can see stacked at the bottom and so that uh, graduated tail is visible here and when it's substantial it's a good field mark to distinguish Cooper's hawks. Then here are um, dorsal views of the two birds. You can con contrast the gray of the adult with the light nape and the dark cap with the brownish tones of a fresh juvenile bird. Um, as the new feathers age in the sun, they both get faded and more lighter brownish. So an adult feather loses that very uh, distinct gray marking that it has as the feathers age until it molts again the following year. Also note on the juvenile those white spangles on the back. Um, all exhibitor juvenile species may display those spangles in varying amounts from zero to extensive. Um, I believe it's kind of a camouflage, a cryptic plumage effect where those white bright spots look like dappling of sunlight under the leaves and that may help the Cooper's hawk blend in um, as a juvenile when it's lurking in uh, the foliage. So um, these are three stages of the Cooper's hawk. I've repeated the juvenile and adult birds from the previous slide, but in the middle you'll see a transitional bird which is in the early summer of its first year as it begins to get adult plumage. You can see the gray tail feathers in the center growing in. Those feathers look shorter than the very worn juvenile feathers underneath them, but they haven't fully grown yet. When those feathers go to their full length, they will extend as the longest uh, tail feathers in that bird's tail. You can also see on the back a contrast between the new juvenile covert feathers that cover the flight feathers. I'm sorry, the new adult uh, coverts with the older brown juvenile feathers interspersed there and underneath. You can also see that in spite of its relatively young adulthood, this bird is transitioning from a yellow eye into an orange eye that will eventually get to be a deeper red color. Now that change in eye color is interesting, but it's highly variable from individual to individual. When Cooper's hawks first leave the nest as fledglings, their yellowish eye actually has kind of a greenish gray tone to it, which as the bird ages in its first year becomes more yellow uh, and eventually progressing into yellow-orange colors. And then as each year passes, the eye gets redder and redder until an adult bird can have that dark garnet red eye that you see here. Um, one difference between adult male and adult female plumage is in the vividness and intensity of the coloration. Males end up not only with a darker red eye that no matter how old they get, females usually don't show. Also with the feathers, this bird that you see here is a male bird, freshly molted, beginning its breeding season. And notice the blue-gray steel colors on the back. Notice the very dark red garnet colored eye. And also notice the tip of the tail, which has a very prominent white terminal band. Usually when Cooper's hawks molt, that white tail band is very bright, and it's also thick. 
But as the feathers age during the course of the year with the wear and tear that Cooper's hawks put on them, that tail band wears away and that terminal band can be smaller and smaller until it's almost invisible by the time the bird is ready to molt again. So if you see a bird in early summer with a wide white tail band and you wonder, is that a sharp shinned or a cooper's hawk? That tail band, the terminal band, which is also present in sharp shins, but in a much smaller way, can be an indicator of cooper's hawk. I want to contrast the warm brown rufousy tones of the bird on the right with the, the cool silvery blue tones on the left because that is often an indication that the bird in question is female. Not all males have that bluish silvery gray tone, the cool tones of gray. Some of them can exhibit the warmer brown tones, but if you see those cool silvery tones, you're almost certainly looking at a male. Um, there's a chance if you see the rufousy warm tones, it's a female, but it could also be a um, female that happens not to be, or uh, sorry, it could also be a male that happens not to have the silver tones. And again, here's a good contrast between those two. These genders are well known because this is a nesting pair in downtown Davis that a colleague of mine is monitoring. And here you see them both together and can not only get a sense of the difference in size, but also the difference in the, the tone of color. So here's a uh, apparently male bird. And now let's talk a little bit about the prey of Cooper's hawks. As I mentioned, birds are about 80% of their annual diet. Um, the composition of the diet obviously varies with the season and prey availability, and also the particular biome that a Cooper's hawk happens to be living in. But um, normally the other 20% of the diet will be rodents or, and or reptiles and amphibians. There was a uh, documented case during the nesting season of a pair of Cooper's hawks feeding their young about 60% reptiles and amphibians that happen to be available. So as I mentioned, it has to do with prey availability. Um, they also use the perch and pounce technique where they stealthily hide and rely on their speed and surprise to capture prey. They'll also hunt cursorially, which uh, means they'll run on foot. Um, I've seen Cooper's hawks overfly their prey and end up on the ground beside it and then chase it down on foot like one of the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Because they have that kind of intense, highly focused hunting style too, a lot of them end up injuring themselves in their headlong pursuits. The furcula or wishbone um, can fracture. Uh, they can also get other broken bones in pursuit. And as long as it can heal and doesn't debilitate them, they'll keep on doing it. Um, they generally uh, kill the prey by continuously squeezing it. Those long, sharp, strong talons penetrating their prey can kill it, but they've also been known to hold their prey underwater to drown it. Um, as I mentioned, they do hunt cursorially as well as dashing through the brush. Um, here's a video of a Cooper's hawk chasing down a songbird that's in the shrubbery of this garden. Birds of prey have crops instead of gizzards, which are kind of in large sacks, um, more on the right side of their esophagus than the left. 
Um, you know, turkeys and chickens, uh, seed-eating birds will eat gravel collected in their gizzard, and the muscular gizzard will be like a, uh, a, a mill grinding down the seeds. Um, instead, raptors accumulate food in their crop, and it's stored and mashed there prior to digestion. You can see the bulging crop on this bird. Uh, and what happens is the nutritional parts dissolve and proceed through the bird's digestive system. The indigestible parts remain in the crop where they're mashed together in a pellet and expelled. Um, there's a bird in flight with a very enlarged crop indicating it has quite a meal. And when those uh, pellets are mashed all together, the bird will expel them usually right before taking off in flight to lighten the load. Um, they can be, those castings or pellets have fur, feathers, beaks. Um, I've seen the teeth and jaw bones of gophers. Birds that eat insects cast up like grasshopper legs or other indigestible parts of an insect carapace. Kingfishers that eat fish cast up pellets with the uh, spiny fins and other indigestible parts of their diet. But you can analyze those pellets and figure out what prey the bird was uh, subsisting on. And then their droppings, um, because all the indigestible parts are usually thrown out through the mouth before it goes through their digestive system, what comes out the tail end is usually just uric acid, that white uh, metabolic product. Um, it's called hawk chalk or whitewash. And when you find that, it can be an indicator of a common perch for a bird. And if you hide far enough away not to disturb it, you can wait there for the bird to show up and see what it was. Um, in terms of the nest, they're very careful not to foul their nests. So here you see a bird muting over the side, uh, a, a young bird that's starting to get its flight feathers, keeping the house clean. Um, in the nesting and territor in territorial defense, the male does most of the work. Uh, he's the first to arrive on the nesting grounds, builds most of the nest, uh, establishes and defends the territory. And then the um, fem female that's attracted to that territory and accepts the male will spend a lot of time just sitting in the area in the nest stand. Occasionally um, she'll fly out, but generally she guards the area and the male brings her food three or so times a day. After eating, copulation may occur. Remember, he's a lot smaller than she is. She's incredibly fierce. So he will do a soliciting call before approaching her so that uh, he understands when it's safe to approach. And this pre-incubation lasts for about a month. Here's a pair where copulation is about to occur following him feeding her. When she begins laying eggs, um, it happens about every other day. Three to four eggs are common in a clutch. They can do five and rarely six. She does most of the daytime incubation. And as I mentioned, the male brings her food on the nest. And then about 35 days later, after uh, incubation begins, they get hatchlings. Uh, occasionally during the day, uh, the male will relieve the female at the nest, and oftentimes, too, the males end up incubating at night, and the female will sleep off the nest but nearby. Uh, she uses the time to stretch and fly around, drink, bathe, and so forth. Um, people have always wondered about the dimorphism in size, why are females bigger, and I think it's because she spends so much time daytime on the nest, she is better able to defend it from larger predators. Um, a lot of nest predators would love to, uh, you know, eat the eggs or the, the very young uh, hatchlings, 
um, squirrels, snakes, and especially other birds like other hawks, owls, ravens, and crows are nest predators. So uh, it's part of her job during the day to keep those predators away. So here she is returning to the nest and the males flying off on the right to go get food for them all. Um, their eggs look like this. Um, I've excerpted a part from a field guide that says the egg colors are pale blue or green, stained with brown spots, but all the photos I've seen of Cooper's Hawk's eggs show them to be white. Uh, it also said the incubation period was 28 days, and it's actually about a week longer. Although both sexes do incubate the eggs, primarily the female is the incubator. And as you've seen, they nest on a platform nest of sticks. It's lined with chips and bark strips and occasionally soft greenery. And there are the nestlings. Here they are beginning to get their feathers. And now they're beginning to stand up, able to tear and eat the food for themselves when they're two and a half to three weeks old. She is now, because they can fend for themselves a little better, mom can now leave the nest to help with the hunting chores. And here we are at about three to four weeks of age. They begin climbing around out of the nest. Occasionally they can fall out of the nest and end up on the ground during this period. Um, if that happens, the parents are very careful to tend to feed and protect the bird on the ground until in a few days it's able to fly back up off the ground into the nest. And then here are what are called fledglings. Uh, they can fly. They've left the nest 28 to 30 days after hatching. They do remain in the nest vicinity for a month or two. You'll often see juvenile siblings together in the area of the nest for up to 40 days after they fledge, but eventually they end up going their own ways. I'm sorry, let me go back to show you, well, it doesn't show that well in the shadow here, but there's a bit of that tawny wash on the breast of the bird facing the camera that I thought might show better here. And then here is an adult male. Here's a juvenile bird with prey on a post. A nice shot of one in flight. I didn't take a lot of these photos. They're used with permission uh, by those who did. An, an interesting thing about nesting Cooper's Hawks is that in some areas between 11 and 20 percent of the time, you'll see a juvenile female, one still in brown plumage, nesting with an adult male as the, the father. Now you can see the bird on the left, the larger female, it was beginning to molt into her adult plumage with the gray feathers and notice that large white terminal band on the tail feathers that are growing in. But as she nests and hat, uh, lays eggs, tends them and raises the young, she will interrupt that molt until the young are raised and then resume the molt um, in June or July when the young have fledged. I don't know of any instances where the reverse happens, that is with a female in adult plumage successfully nesting with a juvenile male. Um, I think that's due to the fact that so much of the reproductive burden and the uh, hunting and so forth that males need to do to successfully breed and fledge young. Um, it takes the males maybe a, a year or more of experience to be able to pull that off. So what that does is create a population of unattached juvenile males that are called floaters. Um, pairs are often sexually but not always sexually monogamous. Um, 
Some pairs will repair up and, and remate. Others will find new mates each season. There's a juvenile bird in flight. Again, notice the somewhat straight, almost cylindrical body, the projecting head, the uh, graduated tail feathers with the central ones on top, so much longer than the shorter outer ones. And that was a nice shot that clearly showed Cooper's hot characteristics. Generally, this is mostly what you see. And here's a video of a Cooper's hawk being chased by crows. You can see the similarity in size. If you watch this enough, even though it's really fast, you can see the difference in the flight styles of the crows and the Cooper's hawk. It could help identify it. So now let's look at a couple of other raptor species that are similar to Cooper's hawks and can be difficult to distinguish. Um, here is a pair of juvenile birds in hand with a large Cooper's hawk on the left and the smaller sharp shin on the right. That was juvenile plumage. Here's an adult sharp shin and a juvenile sharp shin. You can see the similarities to adult and juvenile Cooper's hawk plumages as well, but there are some differences. There's a hatchier or juvenile sharp shinned hawk and an adult sharp shinned hawk. And in terms of the dimorphism in size, here's male versus female. Also look at the tail shapes. The male has almost a notch in its tail where the central tail feathers are very much shorter than the outer, whereas the female has slightly longer central tail feathers and shorter outer tail feathers. So that points out the difference in size. This points out the difference in tail shape. And then let's also look at head shape with a sharp shin on the left and a Cooper's hawk on the right. Notice the Cooper's hawk has a small, what some people call an ice cream scoop head, whereas the Cooper's hawk has a much larger, blockier head. Also notice that in profile, the sharp shinned eye is centered in that round head. Whereas the Cooper's hawk, with its head flattened and not round, has an eye that is set forward in profile of the center line of the head. Also note the Cooper's hawk has much more of a superorbital process, that bony ridge over the eye that gives it kind of an angry or fierce look if you're going to anthropomorphize, whereas the sharp shinned has a more rounded look to the eye with a less prominent uh, eyebrow ridge. And then also note that the Cooper's hawk has that can show strongly that Roman nose profile where there's an outward curve from the forehead down to the beak, as opposed to the sharp shin, which has a little bit more of a notch between the curve of the forehead and the curve of the beak. And then here, look at the contrast in streaking, the Cooper's hawk. And you've got to look at the center of the breast at this. Don't look at the edges of the flanks. Look at the center of the breast. And the Cooper's hawk has neater, more crisp teardrop shape vertical streaking, whereas sharp shins generally show messier breast streaking. And then also note the auricular area over the ear behind the eye. Cooper's hawks tend to show a very strong, almost like proto-facial disc there, where the feathers seem striated and to form kind of a semicircular structure uh, such as owls or harriers have that help focus sound into the air. That's much less obvious on sharp shinned hawks. And then in flight, notice that if you look at the leading edge of the wings there in this glide, there's very little head projection on the sharp shinned hawk. I'm going to flip the slide now so that it's the same orientation as the Cooper's hawk in in flight and look at how much head projection there is between the front of the wings and the tip of the beak on a Cooper's hawk. So what this means is sharp shinned hawks are called flying T 
like the letter T. Cooper's Hawks are like flying crosses because of that head projection. So also note the tail shape. In this particular photo, you can see the Cooper's Hawk has very graduated tail feathers with the long central ones, whereas the sharp shinned has more even length tail feathers. Red shoulders are another species that can be mistaken for Cooper's Hawks. They occupy similar niches uh, in their environments. Um, it's said that red shoulders are bootios or soaring hawks like a red-tailed hawk. They're bootios that are evolving to be excipiters, and there are a lot of similarities. Uh, red shoulders have a slightly longer proportion tail for a bootio than say red-tailed hawks do, but not nearly as long as an occipiter tail. They're getting there though. They also have uh, reddish underparts and darker top sides. Here's a, a dorsal views of both adult red shoulder on the left and Cooper's hawk on the right. And you'll see that our California subspecies of red shoulders are very vividly marked birds. If you see them in the light, the tail bands, not only are the dark ones wider than on a Cooper's hawk, the, uh, they're also much broader in width. And that black and white checkering on the secondaries and the inner parts of the primary feathers is also very vivid and diagnostic for uh, red-shouldered hawks. And this bird also is displaying the eponymous red shoulders there. Uh-oh. Time for a pop quiz. Let's see how we did in learning to tell sharp shins from Cooper's hawks. So here's our first bird. Think about what you see there in terms of dark cap graduated tail feathers, more cylindrical body, and you understand this may be a Cooper's Hawk. Look at the characteristics here, a light nape on an adult bird, very prominent beak, kind of a blocky head, graduated tail, and a presumed male. This bird, there's no light nape, distinct from a dark cap. The tail feathers seem about the same length. Adult sharp shin. This bird, graduated tail, very long tail in proportion to its body, a good bit of head extension, a kind of cylindrical build, not the broad-shouldered, narrow-waisted, tapering look of a sharp shin torso. So, Cooper's Hawk. And there's the same bird from the underside. Dark cap, squarish head, eye set forward at the center line, thick tarsi or legs, adult Cooper's hawk. Not much head projection beyond the wings, a very square-edged tail. You got it, sharp shin. Bit of head projection, very long tail in proportion to the body, neat underside breast streaking. Cooper's hawk. Cylindrical body, neat dark brown teardrop breast streaks, Cooper's Hawk. A rounded head, messy breast streaking, indentation between the forehead and the sear on the beak, sharp shin. Ice cream scoop head. The tail's a little bit difficult to analyze. Um, a caped look where the dark cap extends down the nape with no 
lighter nape at the back, sharp chin. Here you see highly graduated tail feathers, relatively thick toes, a squarish head. It's a little difficult to analyze because the feathers are roused or upright as they are on the breast. A full crop, but very neat brown vertical teardrops. So we've got a Cooper's Hawk. A notched tail, kind of messy breast streaking, a smallish round head, sharp chin, notched tail, so probably a male. Very thin tarsi, a caped look where the gray on the top of the head flows down the nape of the neck into the back with no distinct cap, sharp chin. Smallish beak, narrow tarsi. Okay, on this bird, a big blocky head. On this adult bird, coop, distinct dark cap, very thick tarsi. And a lot of times, on both sharp shins and coops during the breeding season, but more so on coops, you'll see those fluffy undertail coverts that indicate that it's in fine breeding fettle and ready to go. Adult bird with a dark cap and a light nape, a blocky head, eye set forward of the center line, something of a Roman nose gives you coop. Similar characteristics here, although there's less of a distinction between the cap and the nape. Still a big head, a Roman nose, eye set forward, adult coop. So don't hate me for this. Very, very streaky bird with the streaks going all the way down the body. A really, really stout body with a relatively smallish head. Not a sharp shin and not a coop. This was a ringer, northern goshawk. Also in the dorsal view, look at the tail banding and you'll see not only is it very wavy, but that there's a little white halo at the edge of each dark band that gives you a clue for goshawk. Also the heavy streaking down the flanks at the legs into the undertail coverts is another clue that this is a juvenile northern goshawk. This is indicating the very, very stout body compared to the, the head size, which it shares as a characteristic with sharp shins, but that's no sharp shin. This bird, adult plumage, uh, no light nape, sharp shin, very thin tarsi, tail feathers relatively close in length, Small ice cream scoop head hunched down into the shoulders. Graduated tail feathers, a more cylindrical or slightly barrel shaped as opposed to the tapering V shaped body. Pretty long tail, Cooper's Hawk. Big head, eye set forward to the center line. Neat vertical streaking down the center line. Graduated tail feathers. 
Okay, the next one, sharp or coupe? Let's talk a little bit about Urban Cooper's Hawks now. Um, so they aren't birds of the forest anymore. They're doing really well in urban and suburban populations. Um, the numbers are actually higher in towns than in their natural habitat, the forests. Um, the nesting density in developed areas can be quite high. They provide Cities provide plenty of prey with doves and pigeons. Um, some of the dangers of that, though, include poisoning. If people put out poisons to kill uh, rodents or other pests, Cooper's hawks can eat those poisoned animals as they're wandering around in a daze. Um, also, some of the uh, populations of doves and pigeons can carry parasitic diseases that can infect Cooper's hawks. Um, but one of the reasons they're doing so well in urban environments is people putting out bird feeders, um, providing seed to track songbirds as well as their predators. So it's a bird feeder in two senses. Here's a juvenile Cooper's hawk lurking at a seed feeder. Here's a juvenile bird sitting on a birdhouse. Cooper's hawks are often photographed in urban settings on fences, um, but that doesn't mean they also don't lurk deep in the foliage of trees. Here's one flying in a suburban neighborhood right down the street to end up with its prey. And Water is a necessity of life for them too, and in urban areas they're finding water where they can. This guy found the mother load. Because uh, they are becoming so well adapted to urban environments, they often end up trapped inside buildings. They'll chase other birds into buildings and attempt to catch them and then become disoriented. In a lot of tall commercial or industrial spaces that have skylights or clear story windows up high, their instinct is to try to get away, not by going low out the door they came in, but by flying high up out of danger away from humans and toward the light that they see as the sky. So as a result, um, over the past several years, I've provided a service to trap these hawks that are inside buildings and unable to find their way out with Bay Raptor Rescue. Here was one uh, in a welding shop, a juvenile Cooper's hawk. This one was in a cabinet shop in the East Bay. And here I am examining it to see whether it's emaciated or whether it's in good enough shape to release outside. And notice that classic Cooper's Hawk profile with the Roman nose and the blocky head and the forward set eye there. This bird was demonstrably happy to be released outside. I've never seen a bird call out and flap so vigorously to get loose of humans and perch in a redwood tree where it could preen and reorient itself. This bird was taken out of a San Mateo church, uh, ironically on the day of the feast of St. Christopher. And this bird uh, was one of about a dozen I've removed from the back of house of grocery stores, an adult male bird. In a residential hotel trapped underneath exclusionary netting meant to keep out pigeons, it didn't work. The coop followed and ate a pigeon and then couldn't get back out through the tiny hole in the netting. And then this is rescue work in the time of coronavirus, a uh, Cooper's Hawk trapped in poultry netting in Novato. And this guy might have been thirsty and came into a winery. This 
particular bird removed from a motorcycle warehouse was quite inspiring. It was something I've never seen before, which is a successful, healthy, one-legged raptor. The bird's tarsus and toes on its right side got amputated somehow. The injury was well healed, meaning this bird had been surviving without a right foot for weeks or months. He was in good shape, and after I captured him in the warehouse, he was released outside to resume his life there. And this little sharp-shinned hawk was uh, captured in the back of a grocery store just to show you that Cooper's hawks aren't the only ones who get into trouble. And this red-shouldered hawk crashed through a glass window pane in a second-story apartment building and was flying around inside uh, the apartment house. I eventually captured it when it was sitting on top of their TV set. So let's talk a little bit about raptor conservation and how we can help. The raptors face a lot of impacts and pressures on their well-being due to all these human-caused sources. Um, some of these things can be mitigated. Some of them are choices. Some of them are accidents. But in any case, the very best thing you can do to help is do not use poisons, especially those single feed decon type rodenticides. They cause so much suffering and death among unintended animal targets. Um, there are much better ways to get rid of rodents. And um, I'd especially like to shout out the one on the bottom line here, raptors are the solution as a means of um, controlling pests naturally by encouraging raptors and other predators to nest nearby and to ban the use of environmental poisons. Um, safe pest control is also promoted by the Hungry Owl Project, which uh, provides uh, nesting boxes for bluebirds, kestrels, and owls. A lot of vineyards are moving away from chemical control of insects and rodents to more natural means uh, with natural predators. I've also listed here some other raptor-related organizations, and I'll put this slide up at the very end while I say goodbye so that you can um, copy anything down that you need, but please feel free to email me with any questions. On this last slide, again, um, Bay Raptor Rescue's email address is right there in the middle, and feel free to email me at that address with any questions or comments. I'm glad I had the chance to uh, resume the presentation and complete the parts that we had to miss due to technological malfunctions. So thank you for listening, and I hope to see you in person in 2020 at the next Environmental Action Committee Point Reyes Birding and Nature Festival. Bye.